for set theory i cannot recommend any one textbook because we are not going to do either naive set theory or axiomatic set theory it will be a mix of them so if you read axiomatic set theory textbooks then they will be too uh, too formal and naive theory text uh, naive set theory textbooks will be too informal yeah so none of them will suit the purpose so instead of that just attend the lectures properly take notes study from them and solve all the tutorial problems yeah hopefully you have all seen the tutorial sheet as well right so uh, last time we started with this yeah that there is the concept of a set is currently undefined yeah until we study logic this will remain undefined what we can do is we can assume the existence of the empty set and from that empty set we can construct natural numbers yeah which we called omega last time that's von neumann <coughs> natural numbers that v in von neumann is actually f because it's german and there is no distinction between sets and elements okay so we are we are used to that kind of thing yeah a is a set and then x is an element small x is an element so there is no such distinction and before we proceed with how to construct new kinds of sets from the existing ones i want to confuse you even more yeah the, that's usually uh, the the thing that confuses everybody it has confused mathematicians for several years so uh, suppose i mean i'm going to tell you a story there is a small village yeah in the middle of nowhere people there don't know anybody outside and outside people are not aware of their presence in that village now there is only one barber in that village so you know barber yeah who cuts hair so the, this barber has a rule yeah very principled man that he will only shave those men who do not shave themselves okay so if there is this person he is the barber and he is uh, one of the villagers then if he doesn't shave himself then the barber will shave him if he shaves himself then the barber won't shave him so uh, that's his principle now the question is who will shave the barber nobody can. huh nobody. nobody can yeah if nobody shaves him so he, yeah happens. if he shaves himself then by his principle he is not allowed to shave himself and if he doesn't shave himself then his principle forces him to shave himself you understand this is called barber's paradox right so there is something similar in set theory it's called russell's paradox so let me write that down so uh, that a set is normal if n is not an element of itself okay now please pay attention yeah to every single word i am about to say let let us say that a set n is normal if it is not an element of itself now consider the set let s be all those ends such that n is normal okay let me write it again all those ends such that n is not an element of itself now this is a kind of reformulation of barber's paradox now the question is does s belong to s yes what are you saying yes or no so if it's uh, like it's just 
it's a paradox. If it belongs to it, it should not be. Correct. It's a paradox that if S belongs to S, then by the defining property, S is not normal. So, S shouldn't belong to S. On the other hand, if S doesn't belong to S, if S is normal, then it should belong to S, so that S fails to be normal. You understand? Now, how is this paradox resolved? I asked you to be uh, very attentive. Sir, can you please repeat what you just said about this paradox? Sure. So, uh, say that uh, you understand the definition of normal. Right. So, if S belongs to S, then what is the property of belonging to S? That S doesn't belong to S. And if S doesn't belong to S, then S should belong to S. So, how can we resolve this paradox? Any ideas? Sir, yes? By introducing the new axiom. Uh, what kind of axiom? Certain kinds of sets are not allowed. Yes, that's that's correct actually. So, S, according to Zermelo Frankel set theory, S is not allowed to be a set. So, I will give you something. So, there is something called, uh, okay, axiom of regularity. in ZF set theory states, yeah I mean uh, it does not really state this, it is a consequence, it states that each set is normal. Okay. So, the set does not belong to itself, no set belongs to itself, otherwise we will get a decreasing sequence, yeah? this is a set A, then A is an element of A, A is an element of A, A is an element of A, well uh, there is another name for this, Yeah, I mean I, I will also write that, it is called axiom of foundation, right? I am not going to state axiom of foundation at this moment, but it implies that no set can belong to itself. And there is also a provision, the collection of all sets is not a set. It is called a class. Okay, so, uh, class is a term which is again not defined. Okay, so, uh, there is a distinction. So, there are certain, so classes can be sets or they may not be sets. So, classes are partitioned into two subclasses. One is of proper classes and another one is of sets. Okay, so, proper classes and sets, that is our distinction. So, the collection of all sets is a proper class. So, therefore, there is no question of asking this. It is not a set. Understood? So, that is how we resolve paradox. Resolution of paradox means we do not let it arise. Right? So, uh, I will write it on the next slide. So, classes are either sets or proper classes. So, these are two different categories. So, uh, given any set, any single set, you can always construct a singleton set, correct? So, there is something called axiom of pairing. So, axiom of pairing implies that given a set A, there is a set X 
whose only element is a yeah which means x is equal to singleton a this is nothing new for you yeah ie x is equal to singleton a that means yeah as a consequence every set is an element of some other set do you agree with this yeah every set is an element of some other set so therefore that is how we distinct uh, we set distinction between sets and proper classes so the a class x is a set if there is some class y such that such that x belongs to o oh, y yes where No, there is some class. So, belong, you have not defined the belong nature. Belonging, yes. So, like for example, the collection of all sets is so large that it does not belong to anything else. Right? So, therefore, we just say that uh, X is a set because we are trying to define a set amongst classes. So, we cannot use the word set in its definition. Okay, a set, a, a class is a set if it is if it is an element of some other class. Otherwise, it is called. Otherwise, a proper class. So here, why will be a proper class or a set? Now that depends on why. Yeah, so we are not saying anything about y. Who asked the question? Yes. So we are just saying that x is a set if it, it is an element of some other class. That is all. And if it is not an element of any other class, then it is a proper class. Why am I writing all these things? Yeah, I, uh, too much philosophy is not good. Yeah, you are just second year students right now, but uh, when we write some expressions like this. So, yesterday we, we uh, saw this union thing, right? A union B. If A and B are two sets, then A union B was defined to be the collection of X such that, can you uh, tell me? X belongs to A or now, the question is where is this x coming from? So, we are choosing it from the class of all sets. I just wanted to say that statement, that is why I said this Barber's paradox, Russell's paradox. Yeah, we are choosing x from the class of all sets. Yeah, because x is not coming from any universal set. We are actually talking about the universe of all sets. Yeah, which is a proper class. Okay, let us go ahead. Can you tell me what is A intersection B? X such that X belongs to A. Now, you can observe that we are again using certain axioms while defining this. And those axioms are hidden inside these words. The words or and and they are part of our understanding, human understanding, which is uh, which in logic is called semantics. Right? So, all of us have exactly the same understanding of the words and 
or if then if and only if right so there is no distinction between our understanding so that's why when we write this we think that we know these things correct the left hand side is abstract notion but we think that we are explaining it using the right hand side the words like and and or see when i'm saying and and or i'm using that middle and again right so we understand language so in terms of language we are explaining something and that's not going to change yeah yes the set theory that you know is not going to change i'm just uh, trying to encourage you to ask more questions that do you really know the things that you feel you know okay any other operation of sets subtraction, subtraction yes so uh, set subtraction right so a minus b what is it all those x's such that x belongs to a and x doesn't belong to b very good any other operation a triangle b okay a triangle b is the symmetric difference operator right so what is the definition x such that x such that what you know symmetric difference no it is a minus b union b minus a so that means exactly one of x belongs to a and x belongs to b holds yeah i mean this is in other words it is simply a minus b union b minus a any other operations that you know i am waiting for one one particular thing Compliment. complements yes i was waiting for that how like with respect to what complement with respect to what class complement with respect to a class that will be a proper class so we don't want to define it right if from the entire universe of sets you just remove one set then it it's still not a set it's a proper class so therefore we don't define it yeah so the notion of complement was introduced to you because you were working locally locally means there was a universal set and you are working inside it and that's why you could do that but there is no notion of complement the complement is re replaced by an appropriate notion of set subtraction yeah what you were calling complement was really the universe universal set minus your set okay any other thing any other operations on sets like the way you can get new sets from existing ones addition product cartesian product yes very interesting concept so what is cartesian product a cross b don't be so afraid to talk yeah i mean you know these things ha uh ha -huh. uh, the pairs x comma y right x comma y such that x belongs to a and y belongs to b very good what is the meaning of this pair everything we are doing is a set yeah i mean on the first slide i wrote that there is no distinction between sets and proper uh, sets and elements so what is this symbol bracket x comma y it is a point what is a point it is a tuple okay what kind of tuple it's a connection of It's a connection between two elements of two different sets. What kind of connection? Huh? It is a mapping. Mapping between what and what? Set A and set B. No, I mean we are choosing arbitrary elements. I am asking you, what is the meaning of that bracket? 
So there are two types of pairs. Yeah, I mean this is a pair that you all agree. It's a, is it an ordered pair or an unordered pair? Ordered, ordered. ordered pair, very good. Now that, that is set. So uh, how do you define an ordered pair? An ordered pair, yeah, not an ordered pair. An ordered pair using sets. Can I, I mean uh, definitions, yeah, possible definitions for for ordered pairs. Give me some choices. Can I use uh, not A, yeah, we are trying to use x y equal to x y. Will this work? Why, why does not it work? We need to differentiate between two elements. Yeah, it is an ordered pair. So, the first element and second element, especially if they are different, then we need to distinguish between them. So, we need to do something different. What, what else can we do? Can we do this? We can do this. Is there any? Uh, so x y and y x will do those two ordered pairs be different or same with respect to this definition? Same. same. So this is also not useful. X zero and y one. Very good. Uh, how should I write x zero? X and the null side. I set with x and the null side. <coughs> what does that mean? Okay, you you are saying this? Yeah. X comma null set? Yeah, and then it should be a another like it should be a set. X comma null set and another set, right? Yeah, and then like y comma 1. Okay, so this is your definition. What will happen if x happens to be 1 yeah. and y happens to be 0? You understand? If it is 1, then this is 1 comma 0, this is 0 comma 1 and then you are not really distinguishing between the ordered pair 0 comma 1 and 1 comma 0. So this also does not work. It is such an interesting concept, right? We always use coordinate geometry. A point on the plane is 3 comma 4, but do we really understand what is 3 comma 4 as sets? Uh, another set consisting of 5 comma 1. Another set consisting of 5 comma 1, yeah. You are just getting trapped into that rabbit hole. Yeah, it is it's not going anywhere. Any other idea? Yes. You can take a set with two elements, one uh -huh. being x, uh -huh. and the second being the set containing x and y. Set containing x and y, yes, okay. One is x and the second containing x and y. Will this work? There do not seem to be any objections, not that we are in a court. Okay. So, Kuratowski's definition is quite close to this. Yeah. So, Kuratowski defined, we are going to look at lot of Polish names. Yeah, Kuratowski is a Polish name. So, uh, defined x y to be equal to the set consisting of two different elements, namely this. Yeah, so we will always follow this. In fact, after this discussion, we will never ever talk about ordered pairs again. Okay, but you need to know this. So, this definition actually helps you to understand the first component. What is the first component? X. X. So, yeah, I, I know it is it's X, but how to obtain it from the right hand side? No, 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 cardinality 1 is not really the right answer. It is the set which belongs to both of them, both of the elements. <coughs> right? The right hand side is a set consisting of two elements.
in general yeah if x is equal to y then nothing will matter if x is equal to y then the right hand side is singleton x and singleton x so therefore everything will be singleton singleton x okay so in that case we understand that both elements are equal if there is only one element whereas if there are two elements then the common element of both the elements is our first component and the not common element which only belongs to one of them is the second component so we can extract information back right so this is a uh, this is a good definition and we'll stick with that so now we understand cartesian products cartesian products are the uh, sets which consist of such elements uh, yeah the elements are these pairs ordered pairs and the ordered pairs are written like this any confusion about this yes last line that's a definition when i say uh, colon equal to that's by definition so kuratowski defined it to be uh, what did you not get yeah it is a it is the set con consisting of two elements the first one is singleton x the second one is x comma y what is the purpose of this because we want everything that we talk about to be a set so therefore from this you can obviously uh, get the first co coordinate and the second coordinate first coordinate is the element which is common to both the elements right and the second coordinate is the element which is not common yeah it is only an element of one of the elements but not of the other right so this is uh, kuratowski's definition of ordered pairs uh, so we are we have also covered cartesian product any new way of generating sets if i am just given one set can i some subset of a given set right now i i was also waiting for this yeah subset of a given set however a subset is not a well defined quantity so when do we say yeah so the question is what is the meaning of a subset equal b can you tell me a intersection b is same as a okay yes uh, well that's also a tutorial problem yeah try to prove these things are equal so the meaning of subset is uh, for all x x belongs to a implies x belongs to b that is the meaning of subset yeah the elements of a are also elements of b but even though a single subset uh, yeah one one more thing before we proceed yeah uh, a subset equal b is the notation we'll use for subset and uh, a proper subset of b yeah this is the notation we will use so this means there is a sub x for which yeah it is equivalent to a is subset of b but a is not equal to b yeah that's also a simple way of saying that that these two sets are not equal so please don't use yeah this is a this is a confusing symbol yeah do you mean proper subset or do you mean improper subset it's never clear so therefore we'll always distinguish by either subset equal or subset not equal okay simple thing however now using subsets 
we can construct one set the collection of all subsets of a given set what is it called the power set, the power set okay so power set so p of a what is the uh, definition all those x's such that x is a subset of a very good so that is our power set so power sets are definitely larger than set uh, any given set and we will see uh, yeah very soon we will see the definition of uh, i mean uh, the theorem which states this yeah that you cannot cantor's theorem which says that power set of a definitely contains more elements than uh, the set a itself however like to formulate that cantor's theorem also we need the concept of a function so i think we discussed this enough yesterday a function is a a function is a triple triple yeah a function f is a triple a comma b comma yeah so can you replace f with something more meaningful i mean okay i will i will write f but equivalently a comma b comma a subset graph of f which is a subset of a cross b yes every function has a graph correct so uh, and a graph is a subset of the cartesian product that's also clear okay so this is what we need which satisfies what property should it satisfy for all x in a there exists there exists a unique y in b such that x comma y belongs to the graph of f well i should be more precise what is the meaning of there exists unique so i will write that down so for all x in a there exists a y in b such that x comma y the ordered pair x comma y belongs to graph of f and whenever y1 and y2 are two different elements and for all y1 and y2 in b if i say that x comma y1 belongs to graph f and x comma y2 also belongs to graph f then then y1 is equal to y2 and i should put a bracket around this yeah that is the meaning of there exists unique right so in normal language we are just choosing a domain so this a is called the domain domain of f then this is the co domain of f and there is a graph so now a function has become a triple triple consisting of two sets and a subset of their cartesian product which satisfies certain properties so how many functions can there be between a and b how many functions can there be i am not asking for the size <coughs> but i am asking if it is still an uh, if it is still a set
observe this every function is in bijection with the collection of graphs uh, right i mean uh, the set of functions is in uh, one to one correspondence with the set of graphs now graphs are subsets of a cross b so therefore how many at most how many functions can there be as many subsets of a cross b so therefore every graph of f is actually an element of the power set of a cross b and therefore the collection of all graphs is an element of the power set of the power set of a cross b so still it is a set understood the argument no i will repeat graph of f is an element of the power set of a cross b yeah because it's a subset that's how we define power set yes all subsets are elements of the power set right so uh, so graph graph of f is an element of the power set of a cross b by the way i'm i will randomly switch between capital letters and small letters yeah don't mind that everything is a set <laughs> in set theory everything is a set so uh, so therefore now graph of f is an element of power set of a cross b and therefore the collection of all such graphs is a subset of power set of a cross b which means it is an element of its power set the power set of power set of a cross b so therefore by uh, you re remember that we said over here a class is a set if it is an element of something okay so we have already got that so let me write it down the the collection of all functions from a to b is a set and is denoted by fun ab yeah because we are going to have fun yeah or b to the power a okay that's also another notation actually there is a, a lot that you can play around with yeah i mean i'm sure you have done this so if b and a happen to be two finite numbers let's say 3 and 2 then how many functions are there from 2 to 3 precisely 3 to the power 2 yeah because for every element you are choosing one image right so therefore this actually this notation is consistent with exponentiation when you take the size of b to the power a it is size of b to the power size of a i'm just not going to write it because we haven't defined size okay soon we will define size but that's why the notation is there yeah the not uh, but both notations are useful so this is yet another way of constructing a new set from existing sets if a and b are sets then a cross uh, fun, fun ab is also a new set okay so uh, there are some special types of functions what are they i mean you give me gave me list of functions yesterday but i am not asking about that type of those types of functions like set theoretic set theoretically important classes of functions bijective bijective can be broken down into two okay so we will write a function yeah so the see uh, how to write a function i am sure you know this but writing is an important skill so i will explain the difference between these two arrows also 
So, f is a function from a to b, we write colon and an arrow, whereas this arrow at the bottom x maps to fx. Yeah? At some point you should also start learning LaTeX and in LaTeX the code is actually just backslash maps to. Right? This is to this arrow and this arrow is maps to. So, in your writing try, try to incorporate these two different types of arrows. What this says, yeah this is x is going somewhere whereas a, a is not going anywhere. Yeah, this does not say it is going anywhere, it is a rule from A to B. Okay, so, these two are different types of arrows. Okay, uh, so, a function f, a function f from A to B is, let us do 1 1 first. What is the formal name for 1 1 functions? Injective, injective very good, is injective function. If, if what can what happens? X for, for every x belongs to A, there exists a unique. Y. For every x in A, there always exists a unique y in B such that x comma y is in graph. So that's the definition of a function. Please don't confuse that. For every y, there exists a unique x such that f x is equal to y that says it is a bijective function. We are not asking for that. X1 equals x2 implies and implied by f of x1 is equal to f of x2. Exactly. If for all x1, x2 in A, f of x1 is equal to f of x2 implies x1 is equal to x2. Actually, the other side is obviously true. If x1 and x2 are equal, then there is a unique image. So, therefore, we can also put a back, back side, but we never have to check the other implication. right? We only check that given two elements, are they going to two, dis, two distinct elements should map to two distinct elements. That is the injective prop function or uh, it is also called 1 1, right? 1 1 function. Okay, so a function f is surjective surjective if what happens? Somebody from the back, nobody speaking there. <coughs> you don't know what a surjective function is. If for all y in B, there exists a x belongs to A such that f of x is equal to y. Very good. Oh, you are not answering because the answer is too easy. <laughs> Sometimes you do not answer because it is too difficult. And what about bijective? Okay, if for all y in B there exists a unique x in A such that f x is equal to y. Yeah, so bijective is clearly injective plus surjective. Okay, so in last 5 minutes we will just spend some time looking at examples. So, give me some example of an injective function. It is simple. fx equal to x. Again, from where to where? <laughs> that is that, that, the problem. Do not say this, these things. That is that's what you are supposed to learn. From real numbers to real numbers. Okay. So, f from r to r which is given by the rule that x maps to x is, is injective, surjective, everything. Yeah, this is identity. Real numbers also do not matter is bijective. 
ओके सेकेंड एग्जाम्पल समथिंग विच इज इंजेक्टिव बट नॉट सर्जेक्टिव एफ एक्स इक्वल टू एक्स स्क्वायर ओके वी ओनली नो रियल नंबर्स ऑल दो इन दिस कोर्स वी आर ऑल्सो गोइंग टू कंस्ट्रक्ट रियल नंबर्स फ्रॉम नेचुरल नंबर्स या फ्रॉम नेचुरल्स टू इंटीजियस इंटीजियस टू रैशनल्स एंड रैशनल्स टू रियल्स वी आर गोइंग टू डू दैट स्टेप बाय स्टेप so right now i'm just taking your word that you know real numbers because uh it's said that god gave us natural numbers everything else is man made yeah so we have to construct everything from naturals well god gave us not just naturals i mean god gave us only the empty set and everything else is man made <laughs> we are weird yeah we create everything from nothing that's how the story of the big bang theory also goes yeah there was nothing and then there was an explosion everything was created so this is what this is bijective okay so that's why i wrote this yeah this is neither injective nor surjective <laughs> can you give me a function from natural numbers to natural numbers which is injective but not surjective so this map only for n to n to n this map from n to n okay so n to n and please remember natural numbers do contain zero yes i'm going to say that all the time is injective but not surjective okay so in this case what is the image of f set of all perfect squares it is the set of all those y's in n such that there exists and x in n such that y is equal to x square yeah he gave me the answer and he is not happy because i just butchered his <laughs> simple enough definition we can also use this yeah 0 1 4 9 however this this particular thing is misleading yeah sequences are very misleading there uh, you expect the next term to be something but it could be an entirely different sequence so therefore it's not really a good good way of writing things okay so this is image of f uh, it is injective but not surjective any function which is surjective but not injective x maps to sin x that is surjective 0 to 10x 0 to 5 but it is 0 to pi Okay, we are going complicated. How about real numbers? To zero one, uh, minus one one. Yeah, x maps to sine x. This is surjective, but not injective. okay so in tomorrow's class we will define what is a finite set and we will also look at some other things associated with functions like direct image of a subset and inverse images of subsets ha huh? i mean uh, once we get to this point you all might feel it's the course is very easy the first lecture was too difficult the second lecture is too easy yeah so but it will be a balance between things philosophically you will have to think a lot but not much is happening as far as sets are concerned yeah you all know these things so there was an important topic which we missed while studying function sets and functions and that is called the image factorization of a function it's something very simple 
but for the sake of completeness I have written it on the board. So, suppose f is a function then it can be factored as a surjection followed by an inclusion. Yeah, uh, notice that I am not saying injection, I am being more specific. A surjection followed by an inclusion. Inclusion always corresponds to subsets. Okay. So, what is that? I mean I have drawn the picture here. You look at a function f, yeah, I mean uh, we can say that f can be written as h composed with g, where g is a surjection and this is inclusion. So, this is my g and this is my h. The surjection part is simply the co-restriction of our original map. Co-restriction means restrict the codomain and you make it as small as possible. Okay. So, we make it uh, as small as possible means we land inside the image. So, A to G A, what is the rule G? X maps to F of X, yeah, it does not change. So, this is the co-restriction of our original map F and the inclusion part is inclusion of the image inside the codomain. That is all, yeah, very simple thing. So, uh, once a simple example is given sin x as a function, x maps to sin x as a function from reals to reals, what do we do? We factor it as, yeah, I mean this is sin function, this is also sin function and this is simply inclusion. We go to its image, the image is uh, the closed interval minus 1, 1 and then you include that. So, this is called image factorization.